Good morning and welcome to New Beginnings House of Worship as we come to worship a live and a living God. We thank you for being here with us today and we want to give praise to God for all the wonderful things he's done for us in our lives and continues to do. And so we're going to ask Sister Rosalind Turner to seek to come at this moment and welcome you into this worship experience. Rosalind. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Beginnings House of Worship. We are so just happy to see you this morning and happy that you are joining us this morning. Um, we was away a couple of Sundays, and that's just because we were out doing some mission work, the Lord's work, and helping out my sister and keeping little Eric's name just out there and keeping his um, purpose out there helping kids with their scholarship um, endure, endure endeavors, excuse me, um, just pushing them along and helping them with their uh, college future and everything. So we want to thank you for just being a part of us and continuing to support us. And we will also um, keep you in prayer and as usual. And we just, just a wonderful and just happy that you are joining us today. We pray that you will have a blessed day today and that you will have a blessed week this week and just remember that God is always in the blessing business and he always has a purpose for all of us. Have a wonderful and blessed day and blessed week. Thank you. Pastor Turner of Seat. Amen. Thank you Rosalind and we hope you all feel welcome today as we come into this worship experience and we want to just reiterate what Sister Rosalind was saying. We had a wonderful time in Augusta, Georgia uh, this past week uh, where we were assisting with uh, Eric J. Small's uh, banquet and the basketball tournament in memory of our nephew, Eric Smalls, uh, who he, along with two other young boys around the age of nine, were killed in a car accident uh, about eight years ago. And so we are <clears throat> just elated to what we were able to do in working with that uh, ministry through our sister, and my sister-in-law, Rosalind's sister, Frankie Simon, and helping promote the scholarship for young people in that area. We were able to give a thousand dollar donation towards the scholarship uh, from New Beginnings House of Worship and, and we, that's just a part of the ministry that we can will continue to do uh, uh, each and every year that we're trying to find new things that we can uh, donate to and uh, help young people along the way. We were also blessed to be able to help the Augusta Minute Theater with a $1,000 uh, donation towards their capital campaign. And so we uh, continue to work in that area uh, with helping young people. The Augusta Minute Theater does a lot of work helping young people in that area uh, during the summer and during the school year uh, to develop skill sets that are necessary and needed in this day and time. God bless you, God keep you. We want you to continue to uh, support this ministry in whatever way you can and support those uh, ministries in your area uh, that, that are in need. And so today, uh, we have a message from God for you today, and it is going to come from uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. And so I'll be reading from the King James Version, but whatever version of the Bible you have, just make sure you have that out and you keep it out as we go through God's Word to see just what God has to say to us all this day. And so the Word of God says, Excuse me. Excuse me there. A little... Technical issues didn't turn my phone off. So let's get that straight. Okay, uh, the word of God today, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah chapter 1, verses, let's start, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. A little disruption, Satan trying to get us all off guard, uh, but we're, we're still with it. So the word of God. Uh, Isaiah 1 16 says wash you make you clean put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do evil learn to do well seek judgment relieve the oppressed judge the fatherless plead for the widow come now and let us reason together says the Lord 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen. God bless you. And so for a moment today, we just like to leave you with this uh, topic, another opportunity to get right. Another opportunity to get right. And so the biblical truth we want to leave with you in this message today is that when God is when God points out your sins, don't try. <laughs> Please don't try to defend yourself. Just surrender to his will. When God points out your sins, don't try to defend yourself. Surrender to his will. There's an old saying that the, the man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. That's, that's a very interesting statement. And some of us, we try to defend our own selves uh, when something comes up. And we are, are uh, it's a very foolish thing to do, to try to defend yourself, to be your own lawyer, to, for you to stand before the judge or whoever that knows the situation and you try to defend yourself around that. We should never try to stand before God and defend our actions when he has already shown us that they are sinful and rebellious. But you know, some people do just that. And you think about your kids, or think about you when you were a child. If uh, a parent said do something and just because they weren't there to see it, you, you thought that you could get away with it, telling them anything, coming up with any story. And, and we try to defend ourselves sometimes uh, when situations come up and maybe someone else started something, but we were in the midst of it and we try to defend ourselves because we don't think we did something quite as bad as the other person. And so <clears throat> then we get find ourselves uh, trying to uh, come up with a way to get out of it when we are just as guilty as the other. We should never try to defend ourselves especially when God has pointed out the situation to, to us. When God says something is sinful and rebellious, we shouldn't come up with our own reasons and our own excuses to say that it's right. We deny that our actions are sinful and say that a loving God wouldn't punish us. If God was so loving, he wouldn't punish us for something like that. We accept the lie as the truth and then say the truth is a lie defending ourselves. We become our own lawyer. <laughs> and when we are called out, we want to defend ourselves, becoming our own lawyer. And so when God speaks to us, are you constantly trying to come up with excuses and reasons why? It wasn't me, but it was, yeah, I only did that because it wasn't that bad. I didn't hurt anybody else. You know, there was a song out back in 1968 uh, by a man by the name of Dewey Markham. He was better known as Pigmeat Markham. And the song said, was titled, Here Comes the Judge. Here Comes the Judge. And so the chorus of that son, that song was, Here Comes the Judge. Here Comes the Judge. Everybody knows that he is the judge. Do you know who is the judge? Do you know that he is all-knowing and all-powerful? the judge. Do you know who he is? Do you know that he's all powerful and all knowing? Do you know that there is only one lawyer <laughs> that can deliver or declare that you're innocent in his court? Only one lawyer. You need to get to know that lawyer and have a relationship and put him on as a retainer. <laughs> and not even just as a retainer, uh, you just need to get to know him and, and, and be a part of his team that he'll defend you. And he's the only one that can declare you innocent in God's courtroom. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Everybody knows that he is the judge. He comes to us every day to convince us to do right. Here comes the judge. But we don't listen. We, we, we don't want to hear that. You don't want us to have any fun. So uh, we, we're, we're not going to listen to that. Uh, the church is always talking about this, that, and the other. Don't want us ever to have fun. 
here comes the judge. He comes to us by his Holy Spirit and by his word. Hey, well, you know, when you say something told me to do that, no, no, it wasn't something. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convinces us and convicts us uh, of what is right. And we have God's word. We hear it in, in sermons. We have it before us to read on our own, to study, and to get to know God better. And we even get a relationship with the word <laughs> by going in prayer to God. Uh, and because the Holy Spirit will then could uh, take our prayers even when we don't know what to say and interpret them to God. God knows exactly what we're asking for. Here comes the judge. He's coming back as the righteous judge, not one that you can pay off in the courtroom, not one that you can get some slick lawyer to try to or, or skirt the law. He's coming back as the righteous judge. Are you ready for his return? Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Everybody knows that he is the judge. You know, some of the amazing attributes of God are his grace and mercy. His grace and mercy. The ability to spare us from what we deserve to get while also giving us what we don't deserve to have. We deserve to be punished because of our sins. And we don't deserve to receive eternity in and of ourselves. But it's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that his grace and mercy allows us access to the things that God has for us, the things that we don't deserve, and to not receive the things that we do deserve to get. Tell God right now, thank you for another opportunity to get right. God is constantly giving us an opportunity to get right. But so many of us, we want to try to defend ourselves. We want to try to do it our way, do what the world says to try to get right before God. And we can't. When I served as pastor of Mount Hope Well Missionary Baptist Church at that time in Donaldson, Tennessee, and now in Nashville, uh, there was a song that Mother Clemens loved to sing. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. And she, she would sing that every so often and, and, and for, as a devotional song when the mothers and deacons get together uh, before prayer. And, and she would love that song. One of the things, of course, is refrains in the song says, uh, <clears throat> I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. Then another one say, uh, the evening train might be too late. Uh, so some of us sometimes, we're not, we're not in a hurry to get ready to go home. Uh, we're not we're in a hurry to get right so that we can go home. Uh, and we want to wait to the last train. And you know what? That last train may not come. Uh, it may be too late. You don't, don't wait till the last minute to try to get right and go home. In Isaiah 1, in this chapter of Isaiah 1, God points out the sinful nature of, of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. It was a divided kingdom at that time. There was the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. But notice this, that not only is the nation sinful, but the holy city is sinful as well. That's something for you to stop and think about. Because we don't think God would disrupt things in the church. Because everything's going well. This is God's place. This, yeah, it's supposed to be God's house. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And we're doing so many other things in the church that we, we can't even serve and worship God. When we look it back into uh, the beginnings of this chapter of Isaiah, chapter 1, uh, uh, Isaiah talks about his reign during the times of Hezekiah, I mean, Hezekiah Ahaz, Jotham, uh, Uzziah. And then he talks about, uh, delivers this message uh, and this, this poignant thing he says in verse 3. It says, the ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Everybody knows that he is the judge. And when you know the judge and you know that he's righteous, then you know how to act before the judge. 
and and so he points out all of the things that are going on. He says, ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. And he goes on and he talks about their worship uh, practices and how he is uh, displeased with the way of worship. He doesn't want your burnt offerings. Verse 11 says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination. And so God said, I'm sick and tired of your ways, the things that you're doing, and then declaring to be my people, I am sick and tired of, and I'm not going to receive them anymore. I wonder when has God lately done something like that to the church? The pandemic? When the churches couldn't meet in, in the church building anymore? How this ministry even uh, grow, grew and prospered out of that? Because God says, I have something that I need you to hear. And it's that you are sinful and that you need to turn from your ways. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let's, let's look at what God has said. Here, God is declaring that they are a sinful nation and that Judah and Jerusalem has to answer to him. Not only is the nation sinful, but this holy city itself is sinful. Their worship is unacceptable before God. And so we need to get right, church, and let's go home. If you're not a part of the church right now, you need to get right and be a part of the church. I know you, you may say there are some things going on in these churches that are hypocritical, and we can't condemn every church for that. Uh, yeah, there are some things going on, but you need to find a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that you need to be a part of. And so here in Isaiah 1, God declares their... Uh, sinfulness and he he comes before them as the judge declaring what is wrong and but you know there's a good news about God the good news is that God doesn't just point out our sinfulness he also gives us the remedy for our ailments <laughs> and I specifically want you to think of it in that light a remedy for our ailments because we're sick sin is a sickness it's an illness it's like a cancer, a tumor growing within us, and we're not doing anything about it. We've been made aware that the, the cancer is there and that there are some things that can be done to, to heal that, to remedy that, to rid that from your body. And we re reject that full for force. So God doesn't just point out your sins and say, go about your way. No, he, he gives us the remedy to cure us, to heal us. And so as we look into this text, as we go on, uh, verse 16, which is where we pick up today. Uh, verse 16 says, wash you, make you clean, seek judgment or justice, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge or defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. And I want you to hear what is being said in this text, because all of this deals with it from a judicial standpoint. You know, seeking justice, relieve or, or help assist the oppressed, those people who are being uh, mistreated. Do something to help them. Do, your, uh, do justice for them. Judge or defend the fatherless. Courtroom proceedings, defense. Plead in your court, courtroom defense. You have to plead your case. Plead for the widow. And, and the first thing I want you to see that God is dealing with and asking us to do is to come clean. We have to come clean. You have to be willing to admit your failures, repent, and get back on track. Yes, that's our theme for the year, getting back on track. And so God is speaking to us today that we have to first be able to recognize that we are off track and then admit our failures, you know, a lot of people don't want to admit it. And I know some people that are in some bad situations, but they can't get themselves out because they're not willing to even admit to themselves that they are in a bad situation. And so they continue to live that way, continuing seeking 
their own way. But God has the remedy for you. And he's asking us all to listen and hear him and receive that. Uh, you have to get back on track. We have to admit our failures, repent. Repenting means turning from that thing that we're in and moving to God, going to God, so that we can get back on track. God has given us another opportunity to get right. We have to put away our evil doings. Because God is present everywhere. We don't think God sees us. Look at what it says. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. God says, I see you. You're doing it right before me. It's just, <laughs> it's just like a bad kid reaching into the cookie jar right in front of the mama and then turning around saying, I didn't do that. I didn't get a cookie. I didn't take it out. Or a kid who had chocolate all over his face. And mama asked, well, have you been eating chocolate? Mm-mm. No children, that's a, that's a natural, our sinfulness makes us naturally defend ourselves and deny that we've done what's wrong. And we have to stop acting like little children. Uh, we have to be childlike, but not childish, as we sp spoke to you a couple of weeks ago. So we have to put away our evil doings. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And there's no place you can go. I don't care if you go uh, and try and do your little thing back in the corner in the booth in the dark uh, where nobody sees you, you think, and try to get away with it. God is present everywhere. He says, stop doing what you're doing. Look at it. He says <clears throat> in verse 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. And those are the two important steps to come clean, two other important steps to come clean. And not only do you have to admit your faults and failures, repent and get back on track, but how you do that is by putting away the evil that you're doing and just, and just stop doing what you're doing. And it would seem like he would say, stop doing what you're doing and put away the evil. But guess what? Because we are the people that we are. <laughs> And we allow the flesh to take over sometime. Yeah, we all do. We have those faults and failures within ourselves. He says, put away your evil doings. And what do we do? We put it away for a minute and go right back and pick it back up again. So that's why he reiterates and says, stop doing what you're doing. Put it away and stop doing it all together. Stop going back into that. Stop going back, picking that thing up. Realize, we have to realize though, that you can't clean yourself up in and of yourself. Yes, I know the text says, wash you, clean you. Wash you, make you clean. And then he goes in to tell you how you do that. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. It's only when you turn from your wicked ways and turn to God that your sins can be washed in the blood of Jesus. That's good news. Look what he says, come now. Uh, I mean, verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fathers, uh, plead uh, for the widow. And then in verse 18, he goes on and when he says that they shall be as white as snow, your sins, they will be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. You can, that only happens when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he will wash you clean of your sins. So when he says, wash you, make you clean, he's saying, put away your evil. When you put the evilness away in your life, when you stop doing those things that you shouldn't be doing, you open yourself up for the cleansing by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, that's why scripture says, make your calling and election sure. Make sure that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Don't, don't play with God. Don't go up there one day and say, well, you know, all this bad stuff's happened to me. Okay, Lord, help me, get me out of this situation. I accept you. And then as soon as things get a little bit better, then we go back to doing the same old thing again. No. Put away your evil doings and cease doing what's evil. Stop doing it. You have to realize that you can't clean yourself up. But it's when you turn from your evil ways and turn to God that you can be cleansed. The second thing that you need to learn from this message that God has for us, not only do you need to come clean 
They admit your faults and failures. Uh, repent and get back on track. You need to stop doing it, put it away, and stop doing it. Yes, you will have some, uh, you may have some stumbles and some falls along the way, but don't let the evil one convince you that you are so sinful that God won't forgive you. He says, if you come and confess your sins to me, I will cast them far away as the east is from the west. We have abundant forgiveness, unlimited forgiveness, access to unlimited forgiveness when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So not only do we need to come clean, but the other thing that you want us to do is to do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yes, I know that was a, a, a thing from a, a movie, uh, Spike Lee, uh, but we need to do the right thing. Look at verse 17. He says, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Again, that courtroom scene that we're dealing with here. But we have to learn to do well. The only way you can learn to do well is by studying the word of God. You need to study, not just read it. Reading it is good. It's, it's a first step. Reading it is good. And you may not quite understand everything. That's why you get into your study. And that's when you pray and ask God for wisdom and knowledge and understanding to understand what it is he's saying to us. And God will open it up to us. The only way you can learn to do well is by studying the word of God. When is the last time you took a little time to study the word of God? You need to study the word of God so that you can be able to do what he describes there. When you're doing well, doing well means you're going to seek justice, not just for yourself, but for others. And when it says seek judgment, it's really saying seek justice. <clears throat> God says in his word that the only thing that is required of us is, is to seek justice, do righteousness, and walk humbly with our God. And are we really seeking justice for others? Do we stand on the side of what is right? Do we stand on God's word or are we wishy-washy because the world says this attitude or this behavior, this lifestyle, this thing is okay? That we can, well, it's not so bad as long as you're not physically hurting somebody else. Seek justice. Not only do you learn to do well by seeking justice, but one of the things in the doing well of that learning to do well, studying God's word, is to provide relief to those that are oppressed. Are you providing any sort of relief to somebody who's going through some things? You can't help the entire world. Yes, that is true. But there are some people in your neighborhood. There are some people in your family that are going through some things. They're oppressed. They may have done some things and contributed to it. But you have to be willing to help them. Now, the scripture tells us to cast not our pearls before the swine. Those, when in that context means those people that are dead set on not accepting that God even exists, not willing to listen to anything God has to say, not accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those people who just don't want to, then you can't help them. But there are people that are going through some situations in their lives that we have to be uh, gracious and merciful enough to help them get on their feet. And then we have to be gracious and merciful enough to know how to pull back and let them stand on their own two feet and not co constantly provide the, the, the opportunity to stand for them. Let them stand on their own. Give them the dignity by giving them relief. You know, some people will try to help people and try to point out how bad they are and how good we are for giving it to them to make people feel uh, small. That I am this nice person who has a nice job and I have this, that, and the other, and you can be just like me if you just do what I say. And we try to make them our minions, make them do what we want them to do. <clears throat> but when you're providing relief to the oppressed, <clears throat> those people that are going through. And so that's a <clears throat> one of the reasons why when you hear so much about Black Lives Matter and, and what stands will the church, the church universal, black, white, Mexican, uh, Hispanic, uh, 
whatever nationality or whatever, those believers in Jesus Christ, we should all stand. Yes, yes. Um, not only do black lives matter, all lives matter. But when we see oppression, when we see things happening in communities, the church should stand up. I don't care what denomination or what um, religious, uh, excuse me, uh, racial makeup of the church is. <clears throat> wrong is wrong and oppression is oppression. And we have to provide relief to those that are oppressed. You have to defend the fatherless. And you need to plead for the widow. <clears throat> there are people that may not have a father in their life. And we need to mentor them. Yes, and there may be some who may have lost their mother. That they need to be uh, mentored as well. We need to not stop saying, well, uh, men are this and this about men. And he could be doing this. No, help out. Defend the fatherless. Those who don't have someone to come and stand in their place as leaders and guiders in their home. Yes, we know that today women can lead and guide their homes just as well as with a two-parent home. It takes a lot of, takes a lot of work. And it puts a lot of uh, pressure on the women. But they have been standing and doing that. But that does not relieve us from defending the fatherless, standing in their stead, giving them the support that they need. And pleading for widows, those who have lost their spouses and can't, because in this context, in that particular time, women did not, if it was a widow woman and the husband passed, uh, she had no property rights. And so there were all sorts of things that were in place to take care of them. But you know what? Some people wouldn't do it. We have to do the right thing. And the only way we can do that is to learn how to do it, and that's by studying God's Word. We need to learn to do well. That's doing the right thing before God. God gives us another opportunity to get right. And whether you are going through something or you witness someone else, you need to get right and help those people that you can and stop hoarding everything for yourself. So not only do we need to come clean, not only do we need to do the right thing, <clears throat> but you need to learn how to plead your case. Plead your case. Verses 18 through 20. As we mentioned to you, this is a, a courtroom scene that is set up here. And so God is coming to us to allow us the opportunity to defend ourselves because he has pointed out what is wrong. And God, being the God that he is, he doesn't just say you're wrong and then destroy us. He give you an opportunity. So many times we misuse that opportunity by trying to defend ourselves. Look what it says in verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. And let's just stop right there. When he says reason together, let us plead our case. I've given you my point. Now you can come and plead your, your case to me. I'll listen. I'm a righteous judge. I'm not going to uh, look bad on you because you are from that side of town. I'm not going to look bad on you just because of personal uh, reasons or financial reasons or what you can do for me. Because there's nothing that you can do for me to make me a better God than what I already am. And so plead your case. This is where we all need to stop and make sure we are lawyered up <laughs> with the only lawyer that can speak on our behalf. You know, they talk about the Miranda rights when you're arrested and taken into custody. If they don't reach you your, your Miranda rights, then uh, they can throw out that those statements or anything that is said. And if you ever stop in the midst and say, I want a lawyer, they have to stop and give you a lawyer. Now, they'll press on a little bit, you see on the TV shows and all of that. Uh, but when you ask for a lawyer, you need to ask for the right lawyer. Stop listening to the adversary who's putting these words into our minds and thoughts uh, to make us say some things that don't even make sense. You won't surely die. God knows that if you eat of that, that you'll be just like him. You'll be a God too. And that, that lie has been going on and being perpetrated ever since uh, the first sin in the garden. You need to make sure that you are lawyered up 
with the right lawyer. Look when it says reason together, used here as a legal term for pleading your case. We must recognize that we are pleading our case before the judge. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Everybody knows that he is the judge. His word stands. Do you know who he is? Do you know who the judge is? Do you? Because if you did, then you would respond the right way. When It reminds me of Ezekiel when God says, can these bones live? Ezekiel said, you know, Lord. The obvious thing to the human mind is that dry bones, that it said that it was very dry. The bones were very dry and scattered. They were all over the place. And God asked the question, can these bones live? Ezekiel was like, you know what? God is asking this question. And I, with my infinite knowledge, only know about what I see right before me. But I know God is better than and stronger and more powerful, can do all sorts of things. So I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just going to say, you know. And that's what you have to do sometimes when you uh, uh, aren't trying to defend yourself or your point of view, that you listen to the lawyer that's there with you and just keep your mouth closed sometimes. <laughs> But you need to get lawyered up. Do you know who the judge is? When God points out your sins, don't try to defend yourself. Surrender to his will. The Holy Spirit is known as the paraclete, the advocate that comes alongside us in the courtroom and declares the believer to be innocent of all charges. That's good news declares us to be innocent. Those who are believers in Jesus Christ, those who made their calling and election sure, those who didn't play around with this thing and act like they are saved. The paraclete comes along, the one who comes alongside, he's our advocate. He's not our adversary. The adversary is trying to pronounce you guilty and declaring that you are guilty. He's standing there also in this courtroom. They're trying to make sure that you are condemned just as he is. But God says, you know what? I'm, what? Let us come together and reason together. Or do you have the right lawyer? Are you lawyered up with the right lawyer? Uh, don't try to defend yourself. Not just uh, coming into the courtroom and, and saying anything that you think in your mind. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us and declares the, the, the believers to be innocent of all charges, not just not guilty, but innocent. You know, there's very few cases where someone is declared innocent. Usually they're declared not guilty. That the evidence that was presented does not necessarily show that you are guilty of that thing, but it does not mean that you are totally innocent. You may have had some things going on. There may be some other things going on in that, that situation. We can't declare you totally innocent, but we have declared you not guilty, meaning that you don't have to suffer the punishment. Don't try to be your own lawyer because you can't declare your own innocence because we're all sinful. When we surrender our life to the Lordship of Jesus, we have the promise that our sins will be made as white as snow. Look what he says there. Come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they're red, they're as red as they can be, they shall be as white as snow. And, and really in this text it says, uh, if because your sins are as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. They can be. Not just automatically just because you stand in there and you decide that you want to be innocent. No, it's because you've given your life to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. We will be uh, declared innocent. We can't be our own lawyer. Our sins will be made as white as snow. We will eat of the good of the land. Not only will we be declared innocent and our sins washed away, but we will be able to benefit from the good of the land. Look what he says. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, 
they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willingly, uh, willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. That's good news. And God makes a promise to us. Even in the courtroom, even when we are standing before him as guilty persons, but when we are there with the right lawyer, <laughs> when the paraclete comes right alongside of us because we have given our life to Jesus, that he can declare us innocent, then God will say, you can eat of the good of the land. The things that I have put there for you, the benefits, the blessings, the favor that I have, you can partake of those things when you do right, when you are willing and obedient. And so we have to stop dragging the baggage behind and say, well, I'll do it, but you know, I, I'm not going to get rid of this right now. I can't stop this right now. I'm, uh, this lifestyle, I want to keep going. You know, the world says that, uh, that you don't have to do this. You don't have to be that way. Uh, I can declare myself to be whatever I want to be. And we want to try to skirt around God's law. No, no, there's no skirting around God's law. He says, come clean. He says, do the right thing. And now plead your case. What will you say? You need to say nothing. You need to let the, the power of the Holy Spirit stand before you as and stand alongside you and declare you as being innocent. When we surrender our life to the Lordship of Jesus, we become white as snow and we will eat of the good of the land. If we try to foolishly defend ourselves, we have the promise that we will be declared rebellious. Look what it says in verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel, so if we refuse to do what God says, we try to be our own lawyer. We try to listen to the wrong person. We get the wrong person to be our lawyer standing in the courtroom thinking that uh, the cost of the Holy Spirit is too much. You know, if we think the lawyer costs too much, we're going to go in and get the cheapest lawyer we can get, as long as he knows something. And and so the price that the Holy Spirit is uh, offering is that it's already been paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. But we think that giving up the stuff of the past is a high price. We think that changing our lifestyle is too high a cost. Trying to do the right thing is too much of a high cost to pay. I want to continue to have fun. You can have fun and enjoy life. Um, the joy of the Lord <laughs> will refresh your soul if we would only just listen to what God has to say and do not foolishly try to defend ourselves. God makes not only the promise that we can live on the good of the land, but if, if we are obedient and willing to do what's right, but if we're going to be uh, refusing to do what is right, if we are disobedient, God will declare us as being rebellious. A rebel will never win in God's courtroom. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Everybody knows that he is the judge. We will be devoured with the sword. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. <clears throat> For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He is the judge. He is the righteous judge. And when he declares you guilty, you will be suffering the punishment of guilt. When he declares you innocent. <laughs> <clears throat> you'll get to live in eternity and eat of the good of the land the rest of the days of your life. And now you have another opportunity to get right. Because God says, let us reason together, come into my courtroom, and I will give you that opportunity. Who will be your lawyer? Who will be there with you? And so we offer to you right now the opportunity to have the best lawyer in the world on your team. We offer Christ to you right now. And it is only by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that you have access to the best lawyer in the land to stand before the righteous judge that cannot be bought out, that cannot be swayed, cannot be uh, convinced to listen to you because you have finances, because you have uh, wealth, because you have 
position and authority on your job. No, you have access to the best lawyer before the righteous judge when you accept Christ into your life. And so we offer Jesus to you right now. If you're out there and you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sins, if you've been living that rebellious lifestyle, if God has been telling you that there are some things going on in your life that you need to change, that you need to get right and come on home, he's standing there waiting for you, the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter, to come to yourself by the move of the Holy Spirit. And he wants you to put away the evil that you're doing. Repent, return to me, and I will wash you white as snow by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you're out there right now, you can put your name in the comment section. Let us know that you want to receive the Lord as your personal Savior. And you may have some things going on in your life and you say, I, I just don't really know how this is going to work out. I, I want to turn around my life. We will get with you and help pray with you and give you scriptures to read that you can work this thing, that you can learn to do well. It's only by studying God's word and immersing yourself into God's word and having that intimate relationship with him that you can turn things around. If you don't want to put your name in the comment section here, <clears throat> you can contact me at 615-473-5464. 615-473-5464. You can leave me a voice message or a, a text message. You can send me a text message and I will get back in touch with you. Uh, and let us know that you're wanting to give your life to Christ or you want restoration. You want to be restored to have a right relationship with God. Again, maybe you've fallen off the wagon. Maybe you've had that thing that you've fallen off track. You've given your life to the Lord and you want to get right, church, and guilt. And, and go home, then we will help you along the way. We would love to have you be a part of this ministry. Here at New Beginnings House of Worship, we are an online church. Uh, we do things into the various communities. Uh, uh, but you know what? If, if you not really, if this is not what you want as a steady church, uh, then we'll help you find a church, a Bible-believing church that will help you along the way. The main thing is that you give your life to Christ right now. Don't wait till later. Don't think that the evening train is the train that you want. You need to get right church right now and catch that morning train uh, because the evening train might be too late. God bless you and God keep you. We want you to uh, know that you can give to this ministry through givelify.com. That's G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y.com. Uh, you don't have to download the app if you don't want to. <clears throat> But that will make it easy. Uh, it's just as easy one way or the other. You go to givelify.com and look for a click on donate. Look for our location at 3919 Kings Lane, Nashville, Tennessee. That's New Beginnings House of Worship at 3919 Kings Lane, Nashville, Tennessee, 37218. Or you can just simply mail it to us at that address, 3919 Kings Lane, K-I-N-G-S, Lane, Nashville, Tennessee, 37218. Uh, this information is posted with this message. So if you have family and friends that weren't able to join us into this worship experience, uh, they may want to look at it later. Share this message with them. We're also on YouTube if they don't have Facebook, but share it uh, with your family and friends. And if you have questions and comments, get in touch with us uh, through Facebook, uh, YouTube, or at our, my contact information, 615-473-5464. And uh, my email, pastornewbeginningshow at gmail.com. Pastornewbeginningshow at gmail.com. May the <clears throat> Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Amen.